Hey, it's Mike here, and today a recent study that looked at ancient mouth microbes or mouth probes to get some answers about what our ancestors ate. The study used advanced technology to get results that a Harvard evolutionary biologist referred to as groundbreaking, but let's be honest, isn't all archaeology technically groundbreaking? Oh, you dig my lame jokes? Anyway, I personally learned a ton from reading this paper as well as the 90 page supplementary material, not including references. So there's a lot of super interesting stuff. So let's go. The study was published in the, I'm just gonna say the full name, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Cause some people have to laugh when I say that acronym anyway. The title is The Evolution and Changing Ecology of the African Hominid Oral Microbiome. All right, so the study made some particular discoveries in the areas of starch and archaeology, or as I like to call it, starchiology, one of my favorite topics that I have not covered in a while, so I'm excited. Science Magazine covered it quite well, and they actually said, quote, the findings suggest our ancestors had adapted to eating lots of starch by at least 600,000 years ago, about the same time as they needed more sugars to fuel a big expansion of their brains. And keep in mind, Homo sapiens, modern humans, appeared around 200,000 years ago, so that is significantly before that. So yeah, there's some good evidence here that we were largely starchivores, starchivorous. All right, before we hit all things starch, we need to do a quick refresher, and that has to do with what the actual structure is. Really simple. You know what glucose is. You put a chain of those together and you get starch or amylose. And in order to digest that, to cleave that apart back into those glucoses, you have to use amylase, our digestive enzyme, which is in our saliva. Fun fact, the most abundant protein in our saliva is amylase. But even then, most of the amylase in our body is actually made by our pancreas. All very interesting stuff. The point is we can digest that starch into glucose. Now in the past, we've had a bunch of really interesting studies looking at fossilized little chunks of starch that appear to be cooked. And that was all really interesting. Learn a ton about what various prehistory people and Neanderthals were eating. But now we have even more advanced techniques that can look at something that is quite interesting. And that is a symbiotic relationship that we'd have with some bacteria in our mouth, which is actually a type of streptococcus. In this case, just a symbiotic bacteria that isn't harming us. Here's where things get really interesting. That particular oral streptococcus actually uses that amylase that we have in our saliva to create a biofilm. It actually binds to that amylase. And so from the study, quote, we find that amylase binding is an apparent homo specific trait suggestive of microbial co-adaptation to starch-rich diets early in human evolution. As for the technology, they can scan this fragmented DNA of this ancient bacteria, Streptococcus bacteria, to see how much of the amylase binding protein genes it actually had. And as the study says, these genes are, quote, found almost exclusively in oral Streptococcus species. So we essentially have these oral Streptococcus genes for amylase binding acting as a sort of timestamp, ancient timestamp for what the host of that bacteria was actually eating. In this case, pre-human ancestors that were eating a ton of starch. And to back that up, as the study says, the streptococcus amylase binding proteins are only robustly expressed in the presence of both salivary amylase and dietary starch. So what they did is they looked at samples, including Neanderthal samples that went back to 100,000 years, as well as Homo sapiens samples that went back 30,000 years. And this is where it gets interesting because they start to project a timeline. They say, these streptococcus groups and that amylase binding protein are a general feature of Homo, suggesting that starch-rich foods possibly modified by cooking first became important early in Homo evolution prior to the split between Neanderthal and modern human lineages more than 600,000 years ago. Sorry if this has been confusing when they, a part literally just popped off of my camera. What? <laughs> On its own, spring loaded, man. Yeah, that was my record button just broke off. Okay, I fixed it. <laughs> anyway, when they're saying homo, they're not talking about what first comes to mind probably to most people. They're talking about the genus homo. So again, we have those hominids, which expands out really far. And then homo, just meaning like us, includes Neanderthals, you know, includes Homo erectus, as well as Homo sapiens, us. This chart slash timeline puts the whole genus Homo into perspective, and you can see about 600,000 years ago when they're talking, we're talking about Homo heidelbergensis, which was a common ancestor for both us and Neanderthals. So 
you can see it splits off there and that is the time period they're talking about. Oh, they're implying that that ancestor Homo heidelbergensis was cooking starch because both of its progeny ended up independently having all of these starch digesting indicators later on. Indicator, like Decatur, Illinois, or De where is that? The point is they're saying us and Neanderthals both give off this particular starch oral signal because it was probably developed by our common ancestor about 600,000 years ago or even further back. And we'll talk about fire in a bit. And another supporting point of all of this is how we don't see this same signature in way older hominids that wouldn't be cooking starch or having access to all of this starch. And that brings me to the study saying, quote, Streptococcus has become the most abundant genus in modern human oral biofilms, whereas it is one of the least abundant core genera in the chimpanzee oral biofilm. And looking to chart C, you can also see the howler monkey or the aluata also did not have this at all, this amylase binding protein signature, yet if you're looking at Neanderthals and if you're looking at Homo sapiens, boom, really high. And it's, let me just say, quite impressive that they were able to get such a clear picture from samples that were like 100,000 years old. Pretty cool. Let's move on to the brain question. A lot of times you're probably told it's all the meat. The meat is the only thing that allowed our brains to grow large. And the supplementary material in all of its 90 pages covers this quite well. And they made some points I've talked about in the past, but it's cool to see them all in a concise spot like this. And the first issue is the paradox of how our brain grew really rapidly while our digestive system also shrank. We know that cooking played some role in this, probably a huge role in this. And while meat was obviously a part of our diet, like say nuts are, there's still the issue of our brain being very glucose hungry. As the study says, it eats up about 20% of our basic calorie needs in the form of glucose. So we need a consistent supply to evolve that growing brain. And yes, that brain doubled roughly in size from about 700,000 years ago to modern Homo sapiens. So we need some major explaining here. And yes, glucose is the preferred fuel of the brain, but people who are on the keto diet love to say, oh, well, you can just burn ketones in your brain. In fact, that's how we evolved our whole brain. It was from animal fat all the time, but there are so many major problems with that. First of all, wild game is generally super lean and sinewy and, and more proteinous, proteinaceous, which is just a bad energy source for the brain needs to be converted and all that. And to echo this glucose fuel situation, back to Science Mag, they say, quote, for human ancestors to efficiently grow a bigger brain, they needed energy dense foods containing glucose. A type of sugar, says molecular archeologist, Christina Wariner of Harvard, meat is not a good source of glucose. A lot of reading in this video. I'm sorry, I just wanna be true to what other people are saying. Anyway, we got even more quotes from the study, the supplementary material actually. And they say, well, historically that meat connection for brain growth has been proposed, quote, but the targeting of energy dense underground storage organs, such as roots, tubers, and bulbs has also been proposed as an increasingly important, albeit archeologically invisible food source during hominin evolution. And that archeologically invisible point is really important. They say that during paleo times, we are most certainly greatly underestimating the amount of plant matter that was involved in these sites. As I've said before, a single animal being killed over a pretty long period of time would still leave 200 plus bones, but you could eat 10,000 tubers without leaving a trace. And brain evolution needs consistency. You need that fuel, which is why a boom and bust hunting cycle would not be as persuasive in this situation. As they even mention here, not only are modern groups going for underground storage organs and foraging, they say, in most cases, they represent a more reliable and consistent source of calories than hunting. As I've mentioned before, if hunting was so amazing for growing brains, why aren't lions as smart as us? Anyway, that's sort of oversimplified in terms of a view, but it's a point worth making anyway, moving on. Another persuasive point is that cooking appears to have a more dramatic effect in terms of absorbability, in terms of calorie gain on plant foods than it does on animal foods. But all of this sparks the question, pun fully intended, does this match up with a timeline of when we might have started using fire to cook? Well, let's take a look. In the record, there's a lot of random fire usage that might have been just 
harnessing wildfires and things like that back at like two million years ago, all the way up to like maybe one million years ago. But we have evidence of consistent fire usage at around 780,000 years ago in Israel, as this study mentions, which is pretty compelling. However, even down to like 400,000 years ago, we can find sites that don't appear to have consistent cooking. They say it might be because they were cooking in ways that just weren't captured. You know, maybe they just had fire pits with sticks as opposed to stone hearths. But if we can see fire usage for cooking at 700,000 years ago, then clearly it could have happened at 600,000 years ago. So yeah, that does appear to match up. Obviously we would all love better data on this, but some of it might never be possible to get. In the end, it's cool to see these technological advances that allow us to see patterns in the historic diet of humans, pre-humans, that we could not see before, that were completely invisible. In this case, we have this Streptococcus genetic stamp that shows, yes, there was a lot of starch in the mouth of the host of this bacteria, which happened to be our ancestors. But I also wanna mention, I don't wanna to appeal to history too hard in terms of our diet. We don't have to eat what we previously ate exactly the same. In fact, it probably wouldn't even be the healthiest food. We can get new foods that are even more nutrient dense and all that stuff that can help us out now. But it is still worth mentioning if that is what we ate, that can inform perhaps some health outcomes, what foods are healthy or less healthy. And it's clear from something like the Broad study where they fed people a whole starch diet and it really helped people who had obesity lower their weight really effectively without restriction. And it would also help answer perhaps why whole grains are associated with lower mortality and on and on and on, as well as how starch, whole starch, clearly does not clog our arteries like animal fat and other high fat foods do. So it seems to be that whole starch is something that we do pretty good with. Plus we have so many people afraid of these carbs, even if they're whole from you know all these low carb diet mentalities and so forth, but you can stop holding back in that sense. You know, everybody wants to eat like a baked sweet potato here and there and, and pastas and stuff, which are amazing. So stop denying yourself. Anyway, I have a question for everybody. I am renovating my new studio. It's not gonna be super fancy or anything, but in the meantime, I've had the green screen down. Should I put it back up? Do you feel like it's way more engaging to have the green screen or does it not matter that much? Let me know and I will put it up if you want it. Anyway, that's it for today. Feel free to like and subscribe. Let me know down below what you thought about all of this starch knowledge and uh, thanks for watching. See you next time.